right, good morning. Uh, I'm Robert Norton. I'm the Vice President and General Counsel of Hillsdale College. I'd really like to welcome you all here today. Uh, this is quite an historic occasion. Uh, I don't know that there's ever been an actual hearing of the Michigan Supreme Court conducted here on our campus. Uh, as many of you know, the college is the second oldest college here in the state of Michigan. Uh, it was established in 1844, and we moved to this location in 1852. Uh, there's many historic events that are associated here with the college. And of course, uh, we have our high school students here today. We want to thank them for being here. We hope this is going to be very informational for you. But as to the college itself, um, the college has been intertwined both in the nation's history and the state's history. Uh, we have num numerous alums that have gone on to public service. That's something that we kind of stress here. Um, our students fought in the Civil War. And in fact, in that engagement, uh, our students, uh, we have the highest percentage of students that took part in the Civil War in the country. And the highest actual number of students was Yale University. They were a much bigger school than Hillsdale, especially at that time, we were only 17 years old. So um, notables in uh, Michigan history connected to the college. There was Austin Blair, who was known as the war governor of Michigan. Uh, he received an honorary doctorate from the college, and he later served here as a faculty member. Um, college president Edmund Burke Fairfield, he helped found the Republican Party. Some of you may know that. He served as a state senator and then as lieutenant governor. Up in Jonesville, there's a Grosvenor Museum house that was actually the house of the former lieutenant governor. Uh, and he was also a college trustee here of the college. Some of our alumni have gone on to the Michigan State Senate. Uh, notables are John C. Patterson in 1864, A.R. Chapman in 1867, H.L. Wood in 1869, and today Eric Nesbitt, a current sitting state senator, uh, is a graduate of the college. There are alumni who also have been involved with the uh, Michigan House of Representatives, Henry V. Perrin in 1850, J.B. Moore, Eugene Belden, G.W. Thompson, A.W. Westgate, Eric Leuthauser, and Andrew Fink currently is a representative and is a graduate of Hillsdale College. On the Michigan Supreme Court, we've been honored to have Joseph B. Moore, C.D. Long, Walter H. North, and we're proud to claim current sitting Justice Viviano as one of our own as an alum of the college. Justice Zara is a distinguished fellow of Hillsdale College and is also our judicial advisor to the Hillsdale College Federalist Society. There's only three Federalist Societies at the undergraduate college level. Usually, Federalist Societies are only at law schools. Quite notable here today is the presence of uh, former Chief Justice Markman, who's been a professor of constitutional law at Hillsdale College for 25 years. He is a beloved and cherished professor here. Those of you familiar with Hillsdale College know that the college holds dear the founding documents uh, but especially those of the United States Constitution and the ability for each state to have its own constitution. We defend the notion of constitutional government. The hearing that will be held here today is a great example of the robustness of our state constitution. The court will be asked to determine the constitutional balance between that of law enforcement that provides each one of us with protection versus that of, in, uh, of individual rights. It's because the case that's before the court today has uh, the need to, to define this demarcation line, previously undefined, the court will give answer and clarity going forward. It's important to know that this case today that we'll be privileged to observe the hearing of uh, has made its way all the way through the appellate process. Most cases do not make it this far, especially for our high school students to understand. It's very few cases that ever get to this level. Most of the cases are resolved at the trial court level, and most of the um, legal decisions you and I will ever feel are going to be done at the local level. So I'm honored today to be able to introduce the chief judge of the Hillsdale County Court System, and that's our circuit court judge. For the benefit of the students here today, you may not know that circuit judges, the name implies they used to ride on a circuit on horseback and go from place to place. And when the circuit court judge arrived, it was a big deal. Basically, the town kind of closed down. This is the day when the big judge has come to town. Uh, all the important decisions that were going to be made have been held. We're going to make these decisions now. 
Now, if you're someone who had done something wrong and there's a strong case against you, you're not so happy that the circuit judge is in town because now your sentence is going to be handed down. But for the rest of the community, they wanted to see law and order. They wanted to have these cases decided. They wanted to know that justice had been served. Uh, there's a historic house, by the way, over on Northwest Street that still stands today that was the home of the first permanent circuit judge that we had. It was a Judge Wilson. Today, the circuit judges remain in place, and ours uh, has um, her chambers and her courtroom is here at our local courthouse. They don't travel around anymore like that. Uh, but if I may, I want to tell you a little bit about our local circuit judge, Sarah Lisney. She was born and raised in Livonia, Michigan. She's been married for 34 years to Anthony Lisney. She's a resident of Jonesville for the last 26 years. She has two children, Eric, 28, who is a uh, surgery resident at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, and Elsie, 26, who is also an attorney. She's the law clerk for Judge Jan Cunningham in Eaton County. She was educated at Eastern Michigan University. She got her law degree from Wayne State University. So she was born, raised, and educated right here in the state of Michigan. She practiced law for 24 years as a practicing attorney. She joined a prestigious law firm in Bloomfield Hills after her graduation from law school. Then she moved to a downtown Detroit law firm, decided the uh, big city life wasn't for her. So she came out to Jonesville and she helped found a law partnership that was known as Marks and Lisney. It later transformed its name into Lisney and Associates. She then decided to serve the community by running for district judge in 2014. She was easily elected by the community that knew her. And then when Judge Smith announced his retirement, she ran for circuit judge opening and again was easily elected by the community that knows her. And you'd think with a career track like that, you wouldn't have much time for community service, right? Pretty hard to practice law. You always have to be building those hours. But yet her community involvement is pretty impressive. She's a member of St. Paul's Evangelical, uh, e Evangelical Lutheran Church, a former Sunday school teacher, a council member. She's a member of the Hills of Bobby Lake Board of Directors. She previously served as a member of the Fayette Township Planning Commission, the Headwaters Recreational Authority, Hillsdale County Co Community Foundation Board of Directors, Jonesville Rotary, where she was a past president, Hillsdale County Exchange Club, Hillsdale County Intermediate School Board of Education, where she was a vice president, the Hospice of Hillsdale County Board of Directors, Student Home Board of Directors. She was even a 4-H parent, a county fair participant, and is a certified master gardener. She's exactly the kind of person that you'd like to see over our local judicial system. I'm proud to know her, to consider her to be a friend of this community. And at this time, I'm gonna turn over the proceedings to Judge Sarah Lisney. That's fine. Can you all hear me? It's unusual for me to have to bend down for a microphone. We were obviously lowering this for my, my height. Uh, thank you, Bob, for the introduction and kind words. And thank you to Hillsdale College for hosting this important event. On behalf of the Hillsdale County Courts, I wish to welcome each of you to today's oral arguments before the Michigan Supreme Court. I can't tell you how happy it makes me to be able to say those words. How many of you either watched or know about the Tiger game from last Saturday? You all know what happened, right? Our own Miggy got his hit number 3000, right? As excited as the Detroit Tigers were about that, that's my excitement for today. <laughs> this is a very special day. As chief judge, I was first contacted in the fall of 2019 by the Supreme Court to ask if we were interested in hosting this event. We, of course, said yes. Immediately, Hillsdale College got on board to host the event, and the planning began. My court administrator at the time, Chris Shainauer, uh, became the court liaison and began working on the many details that go into planning an event like this. It took weeks and months. The event was slated for April of 2020. 
None of us will forget what happened during the spring of 2020. The event was postponed. It was rescheduled to the fall of 21. It was again postponed. And as with most things, the third time was the charm. And here we are today. In the meantime, however, uh, the Ms. Shainauer has retired from service to the county after over 40 years. She agreed to come back for one thing and one thing only, and that was to see this event through. She has done so, and I am, I am grateful for her efforts in making today um, successful. I'd like to give her a round of applause. We will soon be joined by the seven Michigan Supreme Court justices. As you can see, when our Supreme Court hears cases, they do so as a group. That is the opposite of the way that trial courts operate. Each county in our state has three types of courts, a circuit court, a probate court, and a district court. One judge is assigned to each court. Because we work alone, it's unusual for us to come together unless there is a special event. That is part of what makes today noteworthy as well. Here in Hillsdale County, we have three local judges. You've already heard that I am the circuit judge. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you my colleagues, our probate and district judges. First, I'd like Judge Bianchi to stand. The Honorable Michelle Bianchi was elected to the probate bench in 2012, and she has served since then. Prior to that, she was in private practice for many years. Judge Bianchi has a special relationship with Hillsdale College as her daughter is about to graduate in just a few weeks. Next, we have our district court judge, the Honorable Megan Stiverson. Judge Stiverson served as our chief assistant prosecutor and our juvenile magistrate prior to being elected district court judge in 2020. Thank you, Judge Stiverson. I am honored to get to introduce two of our retired judges from Hillsdale County. First, the Honorable Michael Nye, our former probate judge. Judge Nye is also our former state representative. He was appointed to the probate bench in 2002. Judge Nye retired after many years of service in 2012. Second, the Honorable Donald Sanderson, our former district court judge and my predecessor at district court. Judge Sanderson was appointed to the district court bench in 1978. He served as district court judge for 36 years until his retirement in 2014. Is it possible, Judge Sanderson, that you heard over 3,000 cases? Three years. <laughs> he may be the Miggy of Hillsdale County. <clears throat> I also have the privilege of introducing judges from our neighboring counties of Branch and Lenaway. First, the Honorable P. William O'Grady is the Branch County Circuit Court Judge. Judge O'Grady was elected to the circuit bench in 2008 after serving Branch County as its assistant prosecutor and serving as a state trooper as well. Thank you, Judge O'Grady. And then next, we have the Honorable Todd Morgan. He is the newest judge I have the pleasure to introduce. Judge Morgan was appointed last month to the Lenaway County District Court. Welcome to the bench. Previously, he was a public defender and in private practice. I know Judge Morgan from when he was in private practice, and just bear with me with one more sports metaphor, he may be up for Rookie of the Year. <laughs> Thank you. Next, I have um, a, a very welcome surprise for this morning. Um, we have Justice Beth Walker from the West Virginia Supreme Court. Uh, she was uh, uh, placed on the bench in 2017, as I understand it. Welcome. Thank you for being here. She, and she is a Hillsdale College graduate. Now, lastly, I'd like to recognize the rest of you. We have local attorneys, we have members of the community, we have other elected officials, uh, we have court personnel, county personnel, uh, we have schools, teachers, and students all here with us today. I believe that each of us, as Michiganders and Americans, must have an understanding of our system of government. I'm thrilled that all of us will not just be reading about what the highest court in Michigan is doing, we will be seeing and hearing it with our own eyes and ears and increasing our knowledge in the process.
Today, we highlight my favorite branch of government, the judicial branch. I'm proud to be here, and I hope you enjoy this. Thank you. are hot. Can you hear me? Can anybody hear me? No, you can't. Now you can. I just have to talk into it a little more. Good morning, everyone. It is really nice to be here. Um, this is uh, exciting for us. It's our first Community Connections program in a couple of years. Uh, we meant to be here a few years ago, uh, and we are delighted that this is the first place we've been able to visit um, since we've been back on the road. Um, I want to thank a few people before I call this morning's case, uh, our hosts, and I want to welcome the students and their teachers. More than 250 students are participating in this historic event today, including the following schools, Will Carleton Academy, Hillsdale High School, Reading High School, Hillsdale Academy, Camden Frontier Schools, Jonesville High School, and Litchfield Community Schools, which is participating virtually. We are very grateful that you all are participating in this event today. We also want to thank the Hillsdale County Bar Association, the attorney mentors, the students, the teachers, and the community members for all your support. We, we, we appreciate all your efforts. Without our local partners, this kind of program wouldn't be possible. This is the 26th time uh, the court has done this, and as is, is the case with all of those previous events, um, we are very dependent on the local bench and bar. Uh, for their support, for their cooperation, for their mentorship, um, and, and, and this county has uh, stepped up with flying colors, and we're, we're very grateful. We're also grateful to the Michigan State Police and the Hillsdale College Campus Security Department, um, and this argument today is also being live streamed, so viewers can watch it from anywhere in the world, so welcome to those of you who are watching versus live stream. A couple of housekeeping items, um, with the exception of the media and professional photographers, no one else uh, take, take photographs once the argument begins. Um, it's distracting to the lawyers. We're, we'd probably be fine, but it's not fair to them. Um, there'll be plenty of opportunities for photos during the reception when we, when we finish. Um, following oral argument, please stay in the courtroom. You probably already know this, but for the debri debriefing with the lawyers, which we're grateful to them for doing, um, and uh, this year, we have a very special guest moderator, um, our own uh, longtime colleague, retired Supreme Court Chief Justice Stephen Markman is going to moderate the post-argument um, Q&A. He's taught constitutional law here at Hillsdale for nearly 30 years. I'm told he has never missed a class. Um, those of us here on the stage are just delighted to see him again. It's been a long couple years for all of us in lots of ways, but we have very much, much missed Chief Justice Markman and we're happy to have him uh, with us today. Oral argument is a very important part of the decision-making process um, for an appellate court. It helps us um, ask the lawyers what we think are the hardest questions in the case. We've done a lot of work getting ready for this, as, an, as I know all of you have as well, and usually by this time we're focused on what we think the hardest questions are, and we know that counsel will be able to um, help us with those questions. We um, look forward to all of the learning that happens today. We hope that at the end of this event we leave you better informed about the rule of law, about the judicial branch, and about its important role in our democracy. 
So with that, I'm gonna call the case that we're gonna hear this morning, People versus David Lusinski. This is a 20 minute argument. Uh, Mr. Jockins, that means you may reserve time if it works out that way. But you, we, we like you to try and keep track of it. Good morning, Chief Justice. Uh, if I may please the court, my name is Bernard Jockins. I'm here to argue on behalf of David Lusinski. Uh, the traffic stop in this matter was invalid uh, pursuant to MCL 257.267B. There was no actual traffic that was present during the stop. Not only that, there was an unreasonable mistake of law that had occurred from Deputy Robinson's stop in this situation. And also in the driveway, this was definitely a seizure. Normal flow of traffic. A person without authority shall not block, obstruct, impede, or otherwise interfere with the normal flow of vehicular, streetcar, or pedestrian traffic upon a public street or a highway. Mr. Lisinski's car was not stationary at the time of contact with Deputy Robinson and the police. And Mr. Lisinski actually moved his vehicle, unblocking of the theoretical impediment at this time of the imaginary traffic. So it brings into the general theme that if it doesn't interfere, if it doesn't interfere with the normal flow, then the traffic stop in this circumstance would be a no. Mr. Lusinski was not interfering with the normal flow of traffic on Old State Road. And there is nothing in the statute that prevents two cars from communicating when they're not impeding the normal flow of traffic, which this brings something to, uh, as far as the statute is concerned, a community standard, my apologies. We have to look at things uh, locally because the normal flow of traffic is different everywhere in the United States. And it made me think of when I was driving in here on East Ball Road, that that was a road that was very similar to the uh, road of Old State Road where Mr. Lusinski was stopped. So on that road, theoretically, if a car came up to me, I don't think it would have been uh, impeding the normal flow of traffic at that time. However, I noticed in the distance that there was a combine that was like up on, on the left in one of the fields there. Now, if a combine would have been operating on the road, going down the road, then there's good argument that this is something that might have been impeding traffic and controverted the statute there. So there was no actual offense. This was an illegal stop. This was something that was an unreasonable mistake of law by Deputy Robinson in this circumstance. And the statute is clear that it has to interfere with the normal flow of traffic, counsel, not counsel, imaginary or something. Counsel, I have a question. Justice on. Viviano. Um, was there a traffic stop at all in this case? Yes, Your Honor, there was. The prosecutor is going to indicate that there was not a stop. Well, there was definitely me, a stop. And let I me just, let me just, when we think of a stop, you know, we think of a police car activating its emergency lights, maybe even using the loudspeaker, directing somebody to pull to the side of the road. But that didn't happen here, did it? Your Honor, this is distinguished from many other traffic stops. What happened in this circumstance as Deputy Robinson had followed, for some reason, for impeding traffic, had followed Mr. Lisinski, and he pulled into a driveway to visit a friend. When he exited the vehicle, got out, and then there was a police car behind that was blocking the ingress and egress. So therefore, that, would have, that was definitely a stop there. But your client, didn't, he didn't come to, to rest. His vehicle didn't come to rest at the direction of the police officer, did it? No, it did not, Your Honor. However, he was not free to leave. He would not have been able to wasn't exit he, wasn't the drive. Wasn't he free to, to, um, to just carry on and go into the friend's house? Possibly. I don't necessarily think that he was. He was confronted by the police officer. And at that point, there was definitely a seizure because he had provided his driver's license. And there is some objectivity in as to what is considered a seizure there. And in regards to the, the stop, Maybe he could have went in. However, in this circumstance, he was definitely prevented from entering the home. He had to produce his identification to the officer. So and at that point, had, he wasn't free to leave. If he had uh, just um, parked the car parallel to the house and not pulled in the driveway, would that have been a distinguishing factor and then it's not a stop at that point? I don't know if that would have been. 
Because, I mean, this, this has to deal with if he would have been free to actually leave at that point. I mean, he would have been out and parked, but still at the same time, there, he had to obey the commands of the officer, Deputy Robinson, in this circumstance. What are we to make of your client's uh, demeanor? If you've looked at the video, he seemed pretty relaxed. He it was sort of conversational with the police. We know the Court of Appeals found that this was more akin to the police sort of chatting with someone along the street. Um, you know, his demeanor was pretty, pretty um, laid back. Well, that's kind of how people are there. I mean, it's a country. You know, this is in Reese, Michigan. It's a country road. No one is in a hurry to go anywhere or really do anything. Uh, as far as him being calm, he didn't do anything wrong. He had no reason to, to be high strung or to be upset. And quite frankly, that's how his demeanor is. It would be cool if that was something that I, c I could implement in my daily routine as far as my demeanor. You, you, uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. If we get past the question of whether there's a stop, you say it's not an unreasonable mistake of law. As I understand it, Justice Kagan has suggested that a reasonable mistake of law would be whether a reasonable judge would see it this way. In this case, we have a Michigan Court of Appeals case of People v. Salters. Judge Talbot, O'Connell, and Cooper, three judges who sat for many years on the trial court before going to the Court of Appeals and then serving on the Court of Appeals, and these three unanimously concluded that, these, that this would be uh, uh, impeding traffic. Now, even if we agree with you that that's wrong, why would, why would that not be a reasonable interpretation here? Are we going to hold our uh, police officers to a higher standard than we hold judges of the Court of Appeals as it relates to understanding law? No, but police officers should be held to a little bit higher standard than a normal citizen. The, uh, the burden shouldn't but wouldn't, shift wouldn't a normal citizen, citizen follow the uh, decision of people v. Salters if they read it? Wouldn't they understand this to be an, a stop and an impeding of traffic? I appreciate the reference to the unpublished opinion of people v. Salters. I'm familiar with the case, Justice Zara. However, this case is more similar to that of people v. Owen, in which there was an unreasonable mistake of law that was uh, addressed by this court, which I'm pretty sure the court remembers, it has to do with the speed limit that was improperly posted and an unreasonable belief. This mirrors the facts in the Owen case, not the Salters case. In addition to that, in, what in that case, was there a court of appeals opinion that agreed with the officer's interpretation of the law? I can't say with a degree of certainty. Uh, I don't think there was, and that's why I'm, I'm pointing to Salters. Here, there is a court of appeals case that would interpret this statute the same way this officer did. So I, even if it's wrong, would that not be a reasonable mistake of law? No, it's not, because there was no traffic. There was fictitious traffic. The reason for the stop, as indicated unambiguously by Deputy Robinson, was for impeding traffic. And pursuant to the statute, there has to be actual traffic, not theoretical traffic in the future, not something that may occur, not from a combine that's off in a field that's not on the road. It has to actually impede the normal flow. And that's why the most appropriate case to follow is also for that of persuasive authority. And that would be that of the Hannon, Tennessee case, where they dissect eight different state jurisdictions as far as to what would constitute impeding traffic. So you would disagree with Justice Kagan's standard for how we would find a reasonable mistake of law? I think that my words are being minced there. However, well, I'm trying to understand where, where, where do you see Justice Kagan's position here? I mean, if, if, it, if it's a reasonable judge see, would, would, would interpret the statute that way, don't we have that here in Michigan with the Salters case? A reasonable mistake of law can justify a seizure that's under the Fourth Amendment. I'm sure that the court will agree with that. A reasonable mistake of law can justify us under the Fourth Amendment and quite a bit suggesting just the opposite. There's nothing that can be gained from a holding in which it would turn the burden over to the citizen. This is basically passing the buck on to the police being able to use as a sword and shield the Hine case. But counsel, we could, we could agree with you about all of the facts. We could even agree with you about the interpretation of the statute. And there's still this, um, you, you might think of it as a legal fiction that um, we judge the reasonableness of a police officer's mistake by what direction the police officer might have had about the law before the stop happened, right? And the only direction was the Salter case. I'm, I'm not... I, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm sure that 
the officer reads every unpublished case of the Court of Appeals, but the way the Supreme Court tells us to think about reasonable mistake of law is to look at that as one of the signaling devices to help us figure out whether it's reasonable or not. Does that make sense? I understand that. However, with the analogy of that case, Chief, Just Chief Justice, I don't agree with the, the logic there. I don't believe that there is a reasonable mistake of law into this so fact the, pattern. So the answer is the Court of Appeals got it so wrong in Salter that um, the, the officer should have known that this was not, uh, that, 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 this, that there wasn't a valid reason to, to pull behind your client. Is in that my humble opinion, yes. I mean, I believe that that valid reason had extinguished as soon as the, the, the traffic kept going. There was no reason for the officer to follow at that point. Does it matter that the officer, when he pulled your client over or pulled behind him in the driveway, um, didn't mention anything about the traffic, what happened in the street, and instead mentioned concern about drugs? Well, that's what he indicated. He was concerned. Again, something else that I thought that was fictitious. I find that suspect that none of that was mentioned at all. Um, it didn't appear to be something that resembled uh, anything as far as a reasonable stop. As far as uh, the officer not mentioning that, you know, for all, it, it's not like he had approached him and, and said, hey, you know, we're I'm selling Girl Scout cookies. Would you mind buying some for my daughter here? If the, if the officer would have wanted to do that, more than likely, he would not have been blocking the ingress and egress on Old State Road, so Mr. Lisinski would not be able to leave. This was, you know, it was definitely a police confrontation that you know, wasn't just meant to be a general conversation. I, that, the way that the police car was positioned, it was definitely blocking. And I can only imagine what would have happened if Mr. Lusinski would have actually attempted to leave, then we might have also been here for resisting, obstructing, or something like that. Can we turn to the question of whether this is a seizure? I, this is definitely was a seizure because part of, part of what determines a seizure is the object, objectivity in regards to the actual person. And that's not enough. There has to be something that's a little bit more. In this circumstance, uh, there was an officer that was on a driveway on private road blocking the ingress and egress. Mr. Lisinski was approached by the officer and obeyed the officer's commands. What, 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 what command did the officer give to your client? Wanted to ask, he asked for his driver's license. Well, that's a question. That's not a command, right? He'd well, if he, would have, if he would have like flown him the middle digit or something like that, I'm pretty sure that that would have been something else. He was following the direction of the officer, asking for someone's driver's license or if they have identification. That's definitely a command. It's not optional These when cases, you have someone in a uniform that's going to... The cases that deal with seizures talk about, you know, they, we have fact patterns where... Uh, a police car turns its lights on, or where an officer commands somebody to stop or to halt. In this situation, um, it appears as though the officer pulled into the driveway like any ordinary citizen could or would and asked your client some questions. What facts would you uh, urge us to, to focus on in terms of why your client felt additional pressure, not just the pressure that any one of us might feel to respond to a police officer. There's always some pressure. The court, the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court has recognized that. There's always some baseline of pressure that most people would feel to be try to be helpful to a police officer. But the inquiry for us is what additional pressure was placed on your client? Why, did, why, why do you believe your client felt uh, that he was compelled to stay there and to answer the officer's questions as opposed to continuing into the house. Looking at the totality of the circumstances, my client generally likes to follow the law. He was obeying what was directed from the uh, officer. He was approached, asked the for his ID, just, but just, in addition to that... Just so we're clear, the officer never told him to stop, correct? That is correct. And the uh, officer never told him he couldn't leave, right? Officer also blocked the ingress and egress. Him, the officer alone, I know the court is aware, just because it says that is not free to leave doesn't mean the person feels free to leave. There are a lot that of cases. has to do with the objectiveness. There are a lot of cases. Well. A lot of cases deal with the, the blocking of a car. Um, 
mo most of them seem to, uh, seem to be where the police cruiser is parked you know, in a way that a normal car could not be parked and, and, and directly behind a vehicle preventing it from leaving. This situation, as I see it, is a little bit different. The, as I understand the facts, the police cruiser was about a car length behind your client's car. Is that right? It's, it wasn't your regular traffic stop, and it was about a, a car length that was behind it when it was pulled into the driveway. And then the way that the car was positioned, you could not leave the driveway. But the, the police cruiser was about a car length behind, is that right? In other words, it wasn't right up against your client's car. I don't believe that it was, it was right behind. I believe it was about a car length, but he was still a uniformed officer uh, that exited the vehicle. And no, I'm aware. I'm aware of those facts. The lights were not, emergency lights were not engaged, though, correct? That's correct. The, um, well, I'm sort of thinking of it in terms of whether this officer did what an ordinary citizen would have done if they wanted to talk to your client. It'd be normal for people. That's how a driveway is used, right? There's, there's case law that talks about, you know, this is how a driveway is used. If you want to approach someone and speak to them, you pull onto their driveway and get out of your car and, and approach them. Is that, that, that's pretty much what happened here, right? Yeah, the, the, the individual was a uniformed police officer in a police car that had blocked the entrance, ingress, and egress. So that's me, why you didn't you, feel free to leave. Let me ask you this question, because I'm not familiar with this road. Was this the type of road where the police officer could have parked on the road and walked up to the house? In other words, was there parking on the street, or is this? I believe there could have, he could have parked off where it would have been uh, closer to a shoulder. It's a dirt road where there's one lane one direction, one lane the other direction. He could have definitely pulled up and over without you know, going into a bank. He could have parked on that road. One, one last factual question. In terms of blocking egress, was it possible for your client to maneuver his car around the uh, police cruiser if he had gone off the driveway and into the grass? Possibly. But I think that that would have also initiated some other things as well. I mean, we don't, we don't know that, right? If it's possible the officer would have let him go. He would have had to went off into grass, and then I don't know how safe that would have been. Okay. I'd like to draw your attention to the case of O'Malley versus City of Flint, a Sixth Circuit case that I find persuasive, and it's not cited in either party's brief. There the police officer saw a Chevy Tahoe that he suspected of being used to impersonate a police car, and the officer followed it. The Tahoe parked in a residential driveway, and the driver got out of the car. After the driver got out of the car, the officer pulled into the driveway behind the Tahoe, and approached the person and asked if he could speak to him. The court there found that this was not a seizure. A reasonable person would have felt free to continue walking even after the officer's vehicle was parked behind the unoccupied Tahoe. That seems to be on all fours with this case. Why should we not find this Sixth Circuit case persuasive in concluding that there was not a seizure? Well, for one, the reason why the individual was being followed was for something that didn't exist. There was no impeding traffic. In addition to that, this was an actual blocking of an ingress, egress in a driveway. It wasn't a parking lot. And this in addition is, to that, this is, he also this had is to a residential driveway here as well in O'Malley. The circumstance is a little bit different. I don't know if that was in the city or a country or whatnot. I'm presuming it was in more of a rural or an urban area. And why would that matter? Case. Because of custom, which that goes back down into where we uh, began at this, Justice Zara. As far as where impeding traffic would go, which is why we're here, why this started out, there has to be some sort of interruption of the normal flow of traffic. As far as the seizure is concerned, there's cases that do indicate that you know, something, it has to be something in additional. It has to be, you know, if a person was blocked in or if a person had to give his ID, does that follow up on answer any any query that you had I would like to save a little bit of time for rebuttal if that's possible but it's fine with me you have 59 seconds if you sit down really fast mm -hmm. <laughs> council okay. hey, please the court Eric Wanick chief assistant prosecutor for Tuscola County on behalf of the people of the state of Michigan the plaintiff appellee now, I know that we've talked a number of facets here of the law, but what it comes down to is a very narrow issue, and that is whether suppression is proper here. And 
we, in order to decide that issue, have to remember that suppression is a very extreme remedy. It's designed to be a deterrent against officers who bend the rules in their quest for justice and to punish them with unjust acquittal if they break those rules. So the issue has to be one of examining whether there was any unreasonableness on the part of the officer. To defend against suppression, we have three different layers of protection here. First, we have the fact that the officer testified he believed the defendant was in violation of 257676B, the impeding traffic statute. The district court disagreed with that and in doing so had interpreted a Tennessee statute, but that kind of goes against the fundamental principle of statutory construction and, and analysis, which is to examine the plain language of the statute itself, our statute. And our statute you know, does not contain any language whatsoever that says there has to be the active flow of traffic. The specific language is that, you know, you not block, obstruct, impede, or otherwise interfere with the normal flow of vehicular traffic upon a public street. To interpret the statute in a manner that is suggested by the defense is to add language, which is something we can't do as we sit here and interpret a statute. We can't impugn additional language. Based on the clear and unambiguous language of this statute, there is no requirement that there be an active flow of traffic. If that were the case, then, you know, we'd have a whole lot of problems. Uh, whenever I go down to U of M to watch a football game, I wouldn't have to pay for the expense of parking. I could just throw my hazards on and park in the middle of the road as long as there's no active flow of traffic. That's not what the legislature intended. And to try to interpret it that way produces an absurd result, which is one of the things we try to avoid when we talk about uh, interpreting a statute. Can one, can one be guilty sure. of an attempt under this statute? You know, the, the statute doesn't refer to an attempt. It doesn't provide any kind of penalty for an attempt. But it does, uh, you know, state that providing any kind of obstruction in the roadway. And that doesn't necessarily have to be a vehicle. The statute goes on to refer to blockades or, uh, you know, whether you drag a cinder block in the middle of the road. That can be a violation of the statute as well. Council, I, I have a question. Sure. I, I've always believed that you always want to try to keep things simple and practical. So if you could just help me out here, from a practical situation or practical approach to this, if the defendant wanted to employ his rights, what is it that he should have done differently in this case? Employ his rights yes, to? to to not have to engage with the officer. If he, you know, what what is it that he, if he, you know, Basically, what is it that he could have done differently if he wanted to evoke his rights? Uh, if you're talking about at the time of the stop at the seizure, and the driving? It, yeah, yes. I'm talking about okay. the seizure. Getting into the issue of the seizure. Sure. Uh, at the time of the seizure, um, you know, obviously the standard is would a reasonable person have felt like their liberty was constrained? And so, uh, you know, looking at this, the totality of the circumstances, this is happening outdoors. It's not in a confined space. It's not you know, with the defendant in handcuffs. It's not the defendant surrounded by multiple officers, you know, without, he has 360 degrees of egress that he could take to walk away from the officer. There's just nothing stopping him at that particular point. But is it your position, and again, you know, and I totally understand and, and totally hear your argument, but what I'm trying to garner is kind of, you know, anyone in this room here today, you know, who is approached in this situation, I just want to understand from you specifically, just from a practical perspective in terms of how this affects ordinary folks as they kind of go about their business. So I, I just want to kind of go back to that question again. They're on the driveway. Specifically, what should he have done? If he did to not- To allow for us to not be here today. Sure, if, if he had decided he did not want to interact with the officer. And what could he, like, and, that, and that's where I want you to be specific. Yeah. Specifically, if you could share what is it that he should have done? Uh, at that point, he could have entered the home of his friend. He could have gotten back into his car to leave. He could have done a variety of different things. Uh, you know, there, there really wasn't any limit to, uh, 
you know, prevent him from, from doing anything at that point because... Counsel, isn't it pretty basic? He could have not answered the question. You know, the, sure. the basic Miranda rights that I'm sure everybody in this room and around the country is familiar with. He had the right to remain silent. So he didn't have to tell the officer, I don't have a license no. on me. He didn't have to tell the officer, I have marijuana in my car. He didn't have to tell the officer, I just was drinking 20 minutes ago. He didn't have to volunteer all that information. Correct. So if he, whether we'd be here or not, or whether there'd be other cause for an arrest or not, all he had to do is not answer the question, right? Well, correct. This, you know, and in looking at the totality of the circumstances, it, it's very clear from the body language and from the interaction between the two, the defendant and the officer, that this isn't any kind of interrogation that's Did the uh, officer occurring. raise his voice? No, not at all. Did he give any commands to stop walking or to stay put? No, it was a congenial interchange in the driveway. Did he have his weapon drawn? Not at all. Was he, were there any other officers present that were surrounding this individual? No, just the, uh, the sergeant. On the, I asked counsel this, on this country road, if you wanted to visit a friend and speak to him or her, would your normal course be to park on the street or to park on the driveway? I would think park in the driveway. If this is an acquaintance of yours, you would probably feel more than welcome. So the officer here did what any ordinary citizen would do if they wanted to engage another citizen in conversation. Is that right? Correct. Okay. He approached him, uh, you know, and, and it's certainly, again, not an interrogation that's occurring in the driveway. It's a normal conversation asking him, you know, because the officer is is concerned about what he saw on the road. He thought the behavior was unusual, and so he simply made contact to, to follow up and see if there was a problem. They engaged in a, a, a casual exchange discussing what he was doing, and at some point the defendant volunteered on his own. Counsel, is it your position, though, that the average person who's joining us here today, if they were in the same situation as the facts have elucidated, would just feel free to basically walk away, walk into a house, drive away. I mean, is that what you, I mean, I guess my perspective is, is that the people that are here today, if, if you were to ask them if they feel that they would be able to just simply drive away, walk away, go into a house, is that something that most people feel that they could do? Well, that probably varies from person to person, but the standard is whether a reasonable person would feel right, and that's that way. Exactly. So I would say most people that are with us today would be defined as reasonable. And I guess using that standard, would the people that are here today feel that they could just walk away or drive away? Well, as, as Justice uh, Viviano mentioned, the, the law recognizes there's a certain amount of pressure whenever we have contact with police officers and that that done, doesn't in and of itself uh, create a seizure, but uh, you have to look at the, the, the circumstances, again, the totality of the circumstances, whether that reasonable person, what kind of factors, location, for instance, is one of the factors referenced in the case law, um, you know, as opposed to outside in the open, like this case versus Could in he the have driven away? Front, I'm sorry? Could he have driven away? You know, that I don't know. Uh, um, I mean, he, there how was nothing have... to prevent him. The officer hadn't commanded him to stop or right, not but how get would back he have the vehicle. driven away? How would he actually have done that? The well, officer is behind him, so how would he have driven? Would he have to like go on the grass? Like, how would he do that? Uh, from a practical standpoint, I, I don't know how much room is even in the driveway. It's it's difficult to tell, and I've I've not seen the scene myself to to tell you if this is a extremely wide driveway that he could have pulled around him. But you know, he was he was on foot. He could have gotten into his car. He could have gone into the house. Uh, he could have not answered the questions. It, this, this, for all intents and purposes, was just an exchange between two people. And, and as the law indicates, not every contact with a police officer amounts to a seizure for that reason. The, the idea is to, uh, you know, discourage, uh, you know, an interrogation tactic versus, uh, you know, precluding all contact between law enforcement and a citizen. Counsel, does it make a difference that it wasn't his house? You know, I mean, I, I, I would understand the argument if it's like, I, I'm not talking to you, I'm going in my house now, but it wasn't even his house. Does that make a difference? It could be one factor, you know, uh, but he's there to visit his friend. I would assume his friend is expecting him and probably was free to walk in. But uh, again, you know, there, there is a whole lot of, you know, what ifs that could have happened that we never get to that point because 
Uh, the defendant at some point just volunteers on his own that he doesn't have a valid license during the discussion with the officer, and that's, that's when the Fourth Amendment first becomes implicated. Before we um, move over to the discussion of, of Salters, I want to go back to the, uh, the statute and, and the sure. plain meaning of the statute. Um, and when you talked about your, your hypothetical, I want to give you a different hypothetical. Sure. Um, as I'm driving um, to this ev event in oral arguments today, um, the Chief Justice calls me and says, you know, where are you at on the road? And I, and I tell her, you know, I'm 20, 20 minutes out. How's traffic? She asks. And I say, I haven't seen a car for the last 20 minutes. <laughs> Is there traffic? <sighs> Well, I always say if a, if a stream is empty and I throw a rock into the middle of the empty stream bed, eventually there's going to be water there, and, and I'm obstructing that flow whether it's active at the time or not. So, and I, and I again, it, it, the Salters, as you pointed to, you know, the Salters court agreed with that premise that there's just simply no language that says that there has to be that active flow of traffic. And I know it's, it's not published, uh, it's only persuasive, but it's very persuasive in the sense that it, it gives some guidance on this exact issue. So, uh, you know, I, I, I just don't see that there's any language in that statute, neither, neither did the Salters Court. Well, what, what about Estelle, which, which uh, was decided after th this, um, after Salters and after this incident, um, that, that court did see it differently. Well, true, but uh, again, just looking at the fundamental premise behind statutory interpretation, uh, you know, it, I think if the if the legislature had intended, and, and I think a lot of statutory constructionists would agree, if the legislature had intended there to be the active flow of traffic in order for there to be a violation, they simply could have added that language. Well, let's let's just get to the language of the statute. I think you'd have a much stronger case if the statute read "shall not block, obstruct, impede um, pedestrian traffic upon a public street." But it doesn't say that. It says "shall not block, obstruct, impede, or otherwise interfere with the normal flow of vehicular or pedestrian traffic on the street." What word? What meaning do we give to the words "normal flow of tra of the traffic"? Well, that's the question. Does normal flow mean right now, or does it mean in the future? But doesn't it suggest that there's actually some impeding going on? Well, as opposed to impeding or blocking a public street, that's one thing. But when you, when you impede to interrupt the normal flow of traffic, traffic, it seems to me the legislature wanted there to be some disruption of, of the flow of traffic. And there was none here but it doesn't indicate whether that has to be active now or in the future. Am I obstructing traffic when I block it now, even though there is no traffic now? That flow of traffic will be eventually obstructed. Does normal flow mean now, or does it mean in the future? And that's, that's the question. And I think the language is left general enough that you can certainly interpret it the way the Salters Court did. Council, here's my question um, on, the, on the language. If the legislature had said a person shall not impede the normal, or excuse me, shall not impede the flow of vehicular traffic, that seems to me all they would have needed to say if they intended to mean the actual flow of traffic or to impede an actual vehicle. Um, why did they add the word normal? What does that add to the equation? What does that add to the mix? The fact that they said you shall not interfere with the normal or regular or usual flow of traffic. Is that, was that a way of making the, the, the scope of the statute broader? I, I believe so, because normal flow of traffic, normal can vary from one point in the day to the next, whether it, whatever road you might be on, uh, you know, whether you're on your way to Hillsdale or you're on your way to Chicago. So, you know, that... I believe was left broad enough so that it could, you know, encompass people who deliberately create an impediment and, and decide I'm going to put a barricade across two lanes of a highway, even though there's no traffic right now, because I want to be a jerk and I want to block the flow of traffic. So if you're driving your combine down a country road during a time of the day where the usual flow of traffic is very light, you'd be unlikely to violate the statute. Would that be... Correct? 
uh, have a correct assumption? Well, if it's not heavily, tra as long as the vehicle's still moving, I would say you're not violating the. I mean, I'm guessing your your you don't your your deputies in 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 your county don't spend all their time ticketing farmers for driving their farm tractors around, do they? <laughs> no, no, they don't. I see them with their big bales of hay up there when I come up to Port it's, Austin. It's part of the cost of doing business in the country, yes. Right. If, so. Council, if, if we're going to, uh, like, looking at particular individual words of the statute, what are we to make of the fact that it says, by means of a barricade, object, or device, or with his or her person, not specifying a vehicle, which clearly the legislature knew how to do if that's what it was and then the the following sentence talks about uh, you know persons maintaining rearranging or constructing public utility or streetcar facilities in or adjacent to a street or highway what are we to make of the fact that there is not a specific reference to a vehicle when clearly that could have been specific I think you you suggest that your opposing counsel is adding words to the statute. Why are you not adding vehicle to the statute? Again, they, they left it broad enough so that it, it includes anything, not just vehicles. I, you know, it goes back to what I, uh, example I gave. If I'm you know, an, an angry you know, old man and I decide that you know, I think there's too much traffic on my side street, and I decide in the middle of the night to drag two cement barricades out in the middle of my road so that traffic well, can't Well, the barricades are specifically road. mentioned. So True. it doesn't say any with anything possible, or right? It says barricades, object, device, his or her person. What if somebody had a cow in the road? Would that qualify as well? Yes, if they just let the, the animal sit there, they have created a, what, a, a what barricade. The, what a, a what barricade would the cow doesn't be? Oh, uh, like I said, uh, you know, a, a barricade could be a, a variety of different things. It doesn't have to be a cement barrier. It could be any object that you put in the middle of the road that acts as a barricade. The, the problem is if we interpret this to mean that you, know, you have to have an actual flow of traffic at the time for there to be a violation is this old man who decides to block off his road because he's angry at all the kids going up and down his road, there's no consequence to him for this. What, what violation of law has he committed then if he hasn't violated this statute? with blocking the flow of traffic just because there isn't any traffic on the road at 2 a.m. when he puts those barricades up. Can you, uh, you mentioned earlier that the officer, you know, believed the statute was violated and that was reasonable. And we've talked here that there are, um, you know, there's a Salter opinion, there's other Court of Appeals opinion that interpret it differently. What is the guardrail that you think exists under the law to, to safeguard in this, from a situation where the officer says, I, you know, I, I thought it was, I thought it was violated, even though. Yeah, and, that, and that's really, you know, the, that third tier against suppression, the kind of the Alamo, so to speak, is that here we are as learned attorneys and judges debating what this statute means, but we've got a road deputy who believed from his knowledge and experience as a, as a certified road patrol officer that this statute was being violated by what he saw. And, and certainly that meets the very definition of a, a reasonable mistake because even we don't know. Is that, is that analysis though, the, whether or not this uh, evidence should be excluded under the exclusionary rule, which really isn't, it's sort of mentioned in passing under, but, but the Court of Appeals and the lower courts never really got to that, right? So, so even, let's say that we, we disagree with you and we find um, for the defendant in this situation, doesn't, does the trial court still have um, work to do on, on whether or not this should be, ex this nonetheless shouldn't be suppressed? Well, the, the trial court actually issued an opinion where it found because there was no violation of the statute that the evidence should be suppressed and therefore no admissible evidence was admitted at the time of the bindover request and that's why bindover was denied. Uh, the, the trial court never even gave any credence to the argument that was made in briefs about whether, well, if the statute wasn't violated, was it reasonable? A mistake on the part of the officer and his suppression still warranted. The court just focused on whether or not the statute was violated. And so that's why we appealed was because there was just no discussion uh, in regards to, well, say that is true and that that statute wasn't violated. 
is the mistake reasonable or not, and is suppression still warranted? The Court of Appeals didn't address that question. No, no, I'm talking about in the trial court right. level. Thank okay. you. One more question before sure. I let you sit down. If we're, if we're doing a, um, an analysis of whether, if, if, if we viewed it as a mistake of law and whether it's reasonable, can you help me operationalize that um, the majority in Heinz uh, instruction that reasonable mistake of law should be more protective of the suspect than a qualified immunity analysis? What is what work does that do in this case, if any? I, you know, I don't think it, it factors in here because, again, we come back to the issue of whether suppression should occur is, you know, what is our goal in suppression here to punish unreasonable behavior? Well, what behavior of this officer is unreasonable at the end of the day? He believes the statute's violated. He acts on that. If he's wrong, it's still a reasonable mistake of law because his continued interaction with the defendant is nothing more but the definition of reasonable. It's a, it's a casual exchange that only implements the Fourth Amendment at the time the defendant brings up a violation of Michigan law. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Uh, to clarify. Counsel, how do you oh. get around the question as to your client didn't have to speak to the officer or answer questions. The totality of the circumstance in the situations, blocked in a driveway, ends up saying he does not have his ID on him. And in addition to that, Justice Bernstein, we're presuming that Mr. Lusinski could walk into his friend's house. He didn't know that his friend was there or not there. They had conversation, I guess, a day or two before he may be coming by. So he couldn't just walk into the house and then you know, wait for the police to not come up. But in addition to that, the statute does not list a car because a, a vehicle can actually be moved. But under the, the seizure, it was definitely a seizure that occurred in the driveway because Mr. Lisinski couldn't move out there in a way that would be safe or would be reasonable. If you had a concluding remark, you may make it. We kept your opposing counsel up a little extra. Yeah, I'm going to reiterate what I have said before, Madam Chief Justice. Is if it doesn't interfere with the normal flow, then the traffic stop in this circumstance should be let go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. The case will be submitted. Testing. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> uh, my name is Dan Brubaker. I'm the Chief Commissioner of the Michigan Supreme Court. Um, normally, I would be doing this kind of next section of the program, which is what we call the student debriefing. Uh, but fortunately for you today, we have a very, very special guest. Uh, who uh, will be taking that over from me. His name, and it, his name will be familiar to some of you. It's uh, Justice Stephen Markman. Uh, Justice Markman served as a U.S. attorney. He was on the Michigan Court of Appeals for, for a number of years, and then he was on the Michigan Supreme Court from 1999 to 2020. Uh, two of those years, he served as, as the Chief Justice, and I got to work with him very closely during those years. 
Uh, and I know that he's also very proud uh, to be a, a professor of constitutional law uh, here at your very own Hillsdale. Um, to be honest, I could spend easily spend at least 20 minutes uh, going over uh, the li listing Justice Markman's uh, amazing accomplishments uh, in his storied legal uh, career, uh, but I'm not going to do that. Um, I did want to mention, for instance, though, that uh, uh, one thing that uh, I googled uh, him in order to prepare for this. One thing that really impressed me, you, you may not know that he helped draft the Constitution of the Ukraine, uh, and he is currently working on it with a, through a European Union commission, uh, working with the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the Ukraine to establish an independent judiciary in that country. Uh, so just a couple of little things I would mention. I'm not going to go on because the longer I went on, uh, the more he would probably get embarrassed and eventually just pull me off the stage, uh, and I don't want that to happen. Uh, but it, it, I think that's a testament to the kind of person he is. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to bring you the debriefer for today, Justice Stephen Markman. And... Uh, the attorneys, I think if you would bring your chairs up to the stage, we can have you, or you could just sit at the table here, and I think then uh, after Justice Markman's remarks, you'll be able to answer the questions from the audience. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me well? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Dan. Dan Brubaker is the Chief Commissioner, once again, of the Michigan Supreme Court. He's been that for many years, and he is quite likely the most knowledgeable person about Michigan law of anybody in the state of Michigan, and of course an expert on the cases that are appearing uh, before this court. Um, the seven justices who were here a few moments ago are now presumably conferencing about the one case that they've heard this morning. They're discussing it and their attitudes about the case and um, probably questions they asked and questions they might have asked and questions they, they should have asked, but they're doing so in order to ascertain what their initial perspectives are on this case and whether, for example, there's a majority position that's been established among the seven justices, and whether there's also a majority for a particular analysis in favor of a whatever result there might be a majority on. In other words, whether they're inclined to affirm the Court of Appeals, to sustain what the Court of Appeals has done, which is in favor of the uh, prosecutor in this case, or whether they want to reverse what the Court of Appeals has done and thereby act in favor of the defendant in this case. But they have a variety of other options they might undertake as well, including simply saying we shouldn't have heard this case, so we're going to, we're going to end our participation and let the Court of Appeals judgment be sustained, or we want to hear more arguments, or we want more information from the uh, uh, advocates in this case. They have a wide variety of options that they can undertake here. Therefore, an order could be issued within a matter of days, or a thorough opinion could be issued, but not until after several months have elapsed. It's uh, anybody's guess right now, but the court presumably is discussing the options that are available to it. As you know, what you've heard this morning is part of uh, the Supreme Court's once or twice a year visit to a location outside of Lansing, typically to an educational institution as they're doing today, where the appellate part of the judicial process can be presented to students. The trial part of the uh, uh, legal process, I think, is much more um, evident and um, and familiar to uh, most people because they see TV and uh, film presentations, but the appellate process is something that's a lot more hidden. The appellate process is, of course, in a nutshell, that there is a trial before a single judge, a trial, a circuit judge, a probate judge, a district judge, and the losing party in that process generally has an entitlement to a right to an appeal 
to try to correct what he or she <coughs> or it views as the mistakes that took place at the trial process. And uh, that appeal to try to correct the alleged errors would take place before a court of appeals where you no longer have one trial judge, but you have three appellate judges. And the loser at that stage of the process does not have a right to an appeal, but they have a, an opportunity to an appeal before the Supreme Court, which is the highest court of the state of Michigan. Almost every case that the Michigan Supreme Court hears, including the one that they've heard this morning, is at their discretion. There's no entitlement, by and large, to an appeal before the Michigan Supreme Court. I know that the court would extend its appreciation to everyone here at Hillsdale for their efforts in facilitating this argument, as well as to the two attorneys who've consented to allow this case to be heard in a very unorthodox setting before the students here at Hillsdale. Um, so now we're going to have about 20 or 25 minutes for questions before we head to the reception. And during that time, I will call on you and hope that you have some questions for the, uh, for the two attorneys in this case. Um, before we do that, though, I'd like to ask one introductory question of uh, Prosecutor Winink and Counsel Jokum. And it's a fairly obvious question, but I think it's an important threshold question. And that is, why in your opinion, among the 200 or so appeals that are filed from all 83 counties around Michigan, each month did the court exercise its discretion in this case? In other words, why was this case among the two or three percent of all the cases that are appealed to the Michigan Supreme Court that drew a full oral argument of the sort that you saw this morning. Why this case? If I could ask the prosecutor, first of all. Well, thank you, Justice. Uh, you know, as a prosecutor, um, you know, we're dealing primarily with criminal law, and criminal law focuses on the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments to the U.S. and Michigan constitutions. This particular case is ripe with all kinds of issues with regards to the Fourth Amendment. And it has to do with statutory interpretation, which is a fundamental part of what lawyers do. The legislature drafts the law for us. Then it's up to us as attorneys to interpret that to fit the particular situation. And so when we were talking about statutory construction, we were talking about rules that guide us as attorneys and as judges to try to interpret what the legislature intended when they used that specific language. And so you have just a, a litany of different areas that this case covered. There were three main focuses of today's arguments. And one had to do with uh, the statutory interpretation. The other had to do with the Fourth Amendment. And the other had to do with whether or not uh, we as ordinary citizens, our interactions with law enforcement in the community. And you know, what, what limitations are there? Uh, w at what point do we become the subject of a criminal case? At what point do we shift from an ordinary contact between two citizens to one between a law enforcement member and a suspect? So uh, I think that was uh, a, a, one of the reasons why this case was selected because there were just so many different aspects related to the Fourth Amendment and to whether the evidence in this case should have been suppressed or not. Let me ask Defense Counsel. Defense Counsel Jokum, the same question, please. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Justice Markman. Uh, I believe that Eric hit a lot of things uh, right on, on point. And from my aspect as, as a defender, there's not much more sacred than our constitutional rights, in particular the Fourth, the Fifth, and Sixth Amendment, that you're not entitled to unreasonable searches and seizures, that you have a right to remain silent, and that you have, uh, you know, your right to, to counsel. And in this circumstance, I mean, we could have probably had, <laughs> I mean, maybe this is going to be uh, an exam question. This would be a great con law question. This would be a great criminal procedure question that you could probably have a whole entire bar exam in different areas and just have them under different aspects. I, I totally believe that. And when I came across this, I'm like, okay, is this stop good? I'm like, I don't think the stop is right. And then talking to, to, to Eric when we were going through this thing, um, well, I don't think there was a stop. I don't think there was a seizure. 
And I'm like, wow, these are a lot of things that were going on and case law that was un, un, uh, defined. Uh, in addition to that, this is, was to completely unchartered territory. And what we kind of have is, uh, this is based upon a statute that was very specific and it was probably set for, um, I mean, you could, you could read it, everyone could take the time, but for it, it impeding traffic, it's 257.676, and it says the, the normal flow of traffic. And it also mentions these buzzwords like protest or, or, or barricades and things of that nature. So it's, it's my opinion this was set up for to kind of disperse protests. But this whole thing, this was just so many issues between the Fourth, the Fifth, and the Sixth Amendment that needed to be answered that I've, I'm, I'm being honest, I thought that this was one out of the gate, and I think that Eric and I actually said that this is probably something that's going to be decided at a much higher court. And I really thought that these issues were, the legal term would be ripe and also very important. It affects everyone, everyone in this room, because, you know, at the end of the day, you can't just take the Constitution and pick the parts that you like. Okay, could I ask the students who'd like to ask a question to please come to one of the microphones here and direct your question uh, as appropriate. And uh, we'll ask uh, typically that uh, each of our two counsel uh, respond, but we'd ask them to do so with the relative um, concision so that we can get as many questions in as possible. Would somebody like to, to move to one of the microphones? Why don't you please move to the microphone? We can't hear you. And other, others who'd like to line up, please don't hesitate to do it at the other microphone. Um, hello. Uh, I wanted to ask a question to like clarify some of the case itself. Is that okay? I'm a little sure. confused about. Um, I wanted to know what the um, defendant was actually like doing that caused the officer to drive into the driveway and like try to stop him and what was like counted as an actual like impeding traffic because that was part something that was please be brief again responding so we don't re-argue the entire case in the next <laughs> well, few minutes we could do this all day even a lawyer of the floor can be dangerous never said <laughs> now the uh, the case started with the officer who was on patrol and he came across the defendant who is sitting in the middle of the road in his vehicle sitting driver side to driver side with a vehicle facing in the opposite direction. It was two gentlemen just having a conversation in the middle of the road. But as he was coming up, you know, they created a, a, they blocked that entire road. He wasn't able to get around. But as he approached, they saw that he was a patrol car and they eventually moved and he pulled into a driveway just down the road. That makes more sense. <laughs> Council? Oh, they're, um, that's not an inaccurate uh, representation as, as, as to what went down. But uh, there was no traffic. Uh, my, my guy, my, I'll say my guy, I don't like to use the term client, you know, my, my guy, my person, uh, wasn't doing anything. There was, there was fictitious traffic, so, uh, you know, that it ended up getting a, a charge out of that, DUI charge. So, thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we have a number of judges here from Hillsdale and surrounding counties and understand again that every one of the cases the Michigan Supreme Court hears um, is initiated at the trial court level. And the one thing that's true about almost every case heard by every trial court judge in this state is that there's a winner and a loser. <laughs> we wish everyone could be a winner, but it just doesn't typically work out that way. And and remember, once again, the loser has a right to appeal to the Michigan Court of Appeals, in which there are three judges, but regrettably, there's also a loser at that stage of the process, and a winner. And the loser has the opportunity to seek an, op to seek an appeal before the Michigan Supreme Court. Please. So I have uh, two questions. Um, you said that the officer came up and observed them while they were stopped, um, and you say that that's the violation of the law. Why didn't he stop them then rather than following him all the way? Even though they moved away, he, he observed them violating the law. So why didn't he turn on his lights and stop them there rather than waiting till he was parked? It's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> You're going first, Eric. 
Well, what had, what had happened was, is the officer was coming down this, this road and he observed this, and before he got to them, they had moved on and separated, because I think they saw that there was a patrol car coming, and, and then he moved just a few, you know, not very far down the road and into this driveway of his friend. So, uh, you know, the officer really didn't have a chance to, you know, throw on the overhead lights and run the sirens or anything like that. But the officer, uh, what he was doing was what we call in our line of work a community caretaker function, which is, you know, just making sure everything's okay. Sometimes officers have interactions with citizens because they see something that's peculiar. Maybe he was having car trouble or, or there was, uh, you know, some other issue. So he made contact with him. He didn't effectuate a stop, so to speak, because he, he didn't turn on his lights. He didn't... Uh, you know, come out with his gun drawn or anything like that. He basically was checking on him to see what was going on. And then as they were talking, you know, that's when, that's when things kind of went south for the defendant. There was a reason why the emergency lights weren't on when my uh, guy and, and the other car were next to each other. Because they weren't interrupting the normal flow of traffic. <laughs> there was no reason to turn on the emergency lights. So that, that's why that didn't go down. And as I do agree with some of the things that uh, uh, Eric had, had mentioned, yes, there's a community caretaker, you know, un, unofficial provision in every county in Tuscola County is very uh, zealous. They're very serious about that. Uh, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that we should be chipping away against our rights, the Fourth, the Fifth, and Sixth Amendment, in which, sadly, in my humble opinion, the set of facts seems to do. Can we please move on to another question? We're going to have a lot of questions here, I think. Go on, please. So I understand that it's the defense's position that there was a seizure as soon as the police car pulled into the driveway. But I mean, my question, I guess, would be to the prosecution. Do you agree with that um, portrayal of it? Was it an investigative stop? Was it a seizure? Was it just a conversation? And what's the delineation between those different things? Sure. Well, the Fourth Amendment comes into play when there is, a, in effect, a seizure. And until that time that the defendant mentions to the officer during this five-minute conversation they had leading up to it that he didn't have a valid license. Well, the officer knew he had just seen him driving. So at that point, the officer has what's called probable cause to detain him for a violation of the law for driving without a valid license. That's the first time a seizure could take place. That's the first time any violation of the law that would require him to seize the defendant occurs. Before that, you know, there's really nothing much going on. I mean, yes, technically he violated the statute for impeding traffic, which is a, a citation only, but uh, at that point he doesn't have to issue that citation. You know, his inquiry is, you know, what, what's going on? Is there a problem that I should be aware of? Counsel. That's a good looking suit, ma'am. <laughs> it is. You look better than a lot of the attorneys that, that, that come into a lot of the courthouses I go into. And the pocket square is cool, too. Thank you. Um, so you're asking about the, the seizure in, 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 in the driveway. Well, again, you know, uh, you know my, my adversary, my uh, colleague, you know, has his version. The way I see is a little bit different. Uh, Mr. Lisinski didn't feel that he was free to leave. You know, there's a, it's not just one thing. And we had all these hypotheticals where it could go into house, he could have just walked away, he could have gotten his car and you know, laid a gummy and, and driven away too, but didn't do that. So it, it's a series of things, you know, is the, the vehicle blocking in this circumstance and then, you know, giving the invalid driver's license. And at that point, he could have been placed under arrest and as a seizure, and that would have been and there's ways that you can search a vehicle incident to lawful arrest with the inventory policies, which every uh, law enforcement agency generally they're supposed to have. So up at that, that point, you know, if there is a seizure, that's when you know, he wasn't free to leave, you know, argument. But a lot of this stuff is very theoretical. It could go any way, but that's you know, my you know, version as to, to what went down. These two just can't seem to agree with each other. Uh, please, <laughs> Imagine that. go ahead. Um, I have a pretty general question, but why did the officer choose to follow the defendant instead of the other car? Um, and did the other call, car also receive a citation? No, unfortunately there wasn't multiple units out there, so they really couldn't divide and conquer. Um, he ended up 
behind the defendant because the defendant was traveling the same lane of travel as him. So he, he ended up following him into the driveway because they were going the same direction. Well, there was a reason why he didn't pull over the other car. Because it would not have been so easy to turn around, just like on the, the, the dirt road that's here. I, I, I want to say it's East Car, but you know, it's you go one lane, one direction, one in the other direction. So I can't think for off De Deputy Robinson, but from my deductive logic, for, well, I'll just continue to follow this car and see what happens. And I believe that that's what went down because there was if there would have been a reason for the stop, then the lights would have went on. Thank, Thank you for the question. I just like to emphasize that this case is going to be resolved in all likelihood on the basis, as it should be, of what the statute says here. So make sure that each of you take a close look at the statute here to try to figure out uh, the extent to which it's applicable to the present <laughs> circumstances and what precisely its language means or doesn't mean. In the end, as all my ju as all the judges here know, uh, the results of this case, the rule of law, is determined not by us looking into our own individual consciences, but looking to the law that guides the issue that's in dispute. Please. Could the officer be considered traffic? You want to answer that one first, Derek? The officer, uh, when he pulls him over? He's driving down the road. Oh, yes. And oh, yes, sees... yes. Well, yes, arguably he could be considered traffic. Yes. Uh, you know, he is a car that is trying to pass through that particular area, and he did testify that he, was he would have been unable to get around this vehicle until it moved. So Luckily. the empty riverbed has water in it. Yeah. Uh, yes. Apparently, and, apparently. And here's the funny thing now, um, you know, mentioning that as to why the, the stop had or had not occurred. Uh, you know, as far as what traffic is concerned, if the officer would have been coming from the other direction or if he would have been closer trying to get behind, then there could have been an argument for that, in my humble opinion. However, unambiguously, in court records, it indicates that Deputy Robinson was over 800 feet behind the the cars so there was no traffic to be impeded thank you for the question thank you thank you thank you, thank you. yes sir uh, why did you specifically take this case for both uh, well uh, as the prosecutor we we charge violations of michigan law and ultimately what was discovered after the seizure took place and the defendant admitted he didn't have a valid license as there was further discussion that resulted in him admitting that he had used uh, marijuana recently, he'd been drinking recently, and so then the officer engaged in further investigation there in the driveway as to whether he was able to drive legally at the time. And then ultimately his blood was you know, drawn after arrest and confirmed that he would have been under the influence. So. That's why we charged uh, the violation of the statute under the Motor Vehicle Code. And I'll tell you why I got involved. <laughs> um, th this was an appointed case. Uh, my practice is appointed work and it's retained work. And I think that that's important and that's not something I'm ready to get rid of. And uh, procedurally, this got suppressed in district court and then it was con uh, affirmed in circuit. And then I remember after the hearing, I'm, I'm not using your exact words, but you had indicated that you're appealing this because you don't think this is good policy. So Eric had won in, in the, the Court of Appeals, and I have this theory, and I encourage every, all the students to use this when making important decisions. Um, if it's something that, that you remember in the middle of a, a hard workout a good two, three times, then it's something that's important that you should roll with. And this bugged the heck out of me in a long run and a couple workouts, so I just couldn't let it go. So I'm not. Ma'am. Uh, what is the role that you see the court is playing or does play or in your opinion should play in like legislative um, 
intent. Like we saw that the statue, a lot of the justices were questioning that. I believe the actual language was like a barricade, object, person, or device, and there was pushback that it didn't specify a vehicle, and then the prosecution was saying it could be included. What is the role that the court is supposed to play in saying this is what the legislative intended, or this is what they should have said, but this needs to be addressed on the lawmaking level, not the judiciary level? Sure. Um, you know, the, as I mentioned during the argument, the, the fundamental rule of interpreting a statute is to just simply read that language and read it in a common sense manner and, and do your best to try to understand what that intent was based on that language. They, the court is not allowed to, to add language because that's called legislating from the bench. So they have that separation of powers that you all learn about in school with regards to uh, uh, judicial and executive and legislative. So one can't interfere with the other. So that's one of the roles of the bench in the judicial is to use what it's been given and not add to that to determine, well, what did the, what did the legislature intend to accomplish here when they created this statute? There's a way that you could find out some of this information, though. Um, as far as like what I'm asking for in my posture, I'm not asking for anything to be. I'm asking for the statute to be interpreted the way that it was written. However, I have theories as to why it was written that I indicated in my in my argument. And since you mentioned legislative intent, which is a buzzword to me, that you actually care and you actually want to know what's going on, and maybe you'll even be a future lawyer. So there, there's a case that uh, in, in Connecticut where they debunked their possession of marijuana law and they did it because it was based upon racism and the only way that they found that is they had to go back into the old microfiches into like the, the 40s and 50s so that's the type of thing that legislative intent would be more if you're trying to like really go after something constitutionality in this circumstance I think it was for to debunk protests and gatherings that might have been considered unruly and, is, and a lot of times, you know, people are just written the ticket for it because it's under the motor vehicle code because that's what's supposed to protect the public at large and motor vehicles. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I have a question for the, Mr. Wanick. You referred to a Tennessee law in your argument, and I was wondering why that applied given this was a Michigan statute. Sure. Well, um, it was the, at the lower court level, the... Judge, uh, we had what was called a preliminary hearing. That's the first stage in a felony prosecution where we have to establish probable cause that the crime's committed and that the defendant committed it. You have to present legally admissible evidence at this hearing. And the judge ruled that our evidence was not legally admissible because he felt that the statute should not have been construed in the way that I was suggesting. And in order to get there, to interpret it as he did, he focused on a Tennessee statute in a case that interpreted a Tennessee law. Now, in reviewing that Tennessee law, it actually refers to slow-moving vehicles causing an impediment. In other words, driving too slow on a highway. Michigan has its own equivalent of that, uh, that uh, basic speed law, it's called. And so, you know, my position is that it was more akin to that statute than our impeding traffic, which has to do with stationary objects being in the middle of the road. And, <clears throat> but the fundamental tenets that I was arguing to the, to the bench here today of statutory construction is you have to interpret the language of our statute, not incorporate an interpretation of a Tennessee law. Uh, and in, in, in looking at our language from our statute, I think it can only be read one way. So, Yeah, the funny thing about the, about the Tennessee case, the Hannah case, which Judge Bitzer was very thorough and the Tennessee uh, court was very thorough in reaching their opinion because they, they dissected eight different statutes and then they talk about their language and then that was mirrored as well in the opinion and that was mirrored in uh, some of the briefs that were filed with the uh, pertinent courts uh, so in, in, in that circumstance you know that's not something you would call persuasive argument and you know, it was I think that it's uh, appropriate to look at it in this circumstance because it, it's not asking for anything to be added it was doing it out of analogy of parallel, and it was pretty thorough. Thank you for the question. Just for those of you who don't know, could I ask uh, the two counsel here to just very, very concisely explain what the exclusionary rule is and what the a good faith exception to the exclusionary rule is? It means defenders and, always get ganked around. <laughs> and and, and uh, why, why those <coughs> concepts so, are relevant to this case. Yeah. 
Uh, the exclusionary rule is a rule that basically is designed, it's created by the judiciary to punish officers who might bend the rules in order to, uh, as I put this morning, seek justice. Sometimes officers can be overzealous, they may not, may cut corners, they may do things that they shouldn't in order to get statements or seize evidence that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to get if they had followed the rules. And the purpose of the exclusionary rule is to punish officers who do bend the rules by basically taking the evidence out of play and leaving the officer's case with no evidence, which pretty much results in an acquittal for the defendant. So it's, it's, a, it's a very heavy-handed remedy, though. It's designed to, to punish officers who very clearly violated the law in order to obtain the evidence or obtain a statement from a defendant. And the good faith exception basically is designed to have the bench take a second look at an officer's actions whether it be factually what they did or the law as they understood it. And if the officer acted in a certain way or, or based on an interpretation of the law that he felt said a certain or should be read a certain way, even if it turns out he's mistaken after the fact, his actions are still reasonable. They aren't unreasonable. He wasn't trying to cut corners. He wasn't trying to break rules. It just turns out he was wrong. And the law basically says, and under, under that, uh, that good faith, is that we don't penalize officers who just make mistakes. We penalize officers who knowingly break the rules. And so exclusion of the evidence doesn't occur when the mistake is reasonable. The ex exclusionary rule, this would uh, come from, I believe it came into, uh, came into play from, it was under Justice Scalia. And uh, it's something that does protect law enforcement in many ways. And there's nothing that's more sobering than having a, a full-blown evidentiary hearing, uh, addressing a Fourth Amendment issue, and then having a, a, a judge say, yes, this was a violation. However, you know, this was good faith, so we're not suppressing it. So the good faith exception, it, it's supposed to uh, be another level if something is either inadvertent, unintentional, if it was something that's considered reasonable, a reasonable mistake. And clearly in, in this circumstance, I don't think that the officers, uh, I don't think the mistake was reasonable. Okay. Sir? Um, so both of you seem to be very passionate about this case. And uh, I would just like to know why you were so opinionated. About it. So, uh, <laughs> opinionated? Yeah. So, Me? So, you specifically, you uh, <laughs> did one about the combine, right, driving through the road, and uh, you did one about an angry old man that put in cinder blocks or something like that in the middle of the road. And uh, I can't use opinions in my class. We have to go through arguments and every now and then. And if I can't use opinion unaided statements against my fellow classmates, how did you expect it to work here? Well, it. <laughs> I look at the opinions as more of a, our role as attorneys is to advocate. We advocate on behalf of our clients. He, his client is the defendant, my client is the people of the state of Michigan. So we, we advocate as zealously as we can, and our opinions are, are based on the law as we interpret it. We have to support those opinions with case law or statutes. Otherwise, as you indicated, our opinions really don't mean anything. So, you know, we're allowed to express our beliefs on what the law says based on our interpretation of it and advocate a particular position uh, and argue for a particular goal and outcome. So uh, in my particular case, uh, you know, the example you mentioned, you know, I, I used that to highlight the fact that, you know, if, in my view, that statute is created to prevent something just like that occurring. And, and if, if this statute doesn't cover that, and what's the penalty to somebody who does this? So that was sort of the point I was trying to allude to in, in, in advocating for that position. Friends don't let friends get haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> We're on the same page. But, but seriously, um, the, the combine example, mm -hmm. uh, when, I was driving, when I was driving in here yesterday, there was, there was a lot of rural roads, and I can't remember the name, but I have it in my notes somewhere. I want to say it's like East Car. And if there had been a combine there, if I, when I had stopped for a minute, arguably that could have been something that would have been impeding traffic going from one of the other areas. But 
you know, just to under the idea that traffic could be impeded in the future, which I believe that this is a lot of where the government's case is coming from, I don't think that that, that flies. I mean, it has to be actual impeding traffic. And then through that analogy, I mean, that's the best one in which I could have thought of that would have been relevant on the community standard, because if you look at the statute, that essentially says normal flow, which really breaks it down to a community standard. You know, normal flow is going to be different in Hillsdale than it is in my backyard in Lapeer or, you know, downtown on, on Woodward in Detroit City. Thank you for the question. I would say also that the matter of civil and constitutional liberties and criminal punishments and the criminal justice system and how we give meaning to the law are all matters that are properly matters of passion on the part of uh, advocates um, uh, of the sort that we've seen this morning. So I think typically the arguments that we see involve attorneys who are passionate and who feel strongly about an issue. And I think if any one of you, or your family, or your neighbors became involved in the uh, justice system in some way, you would want a lawyer or an advocate who felt passionately in favor of the uh, positions that you were urging or urging against. Please. Okay, well, I was going to call on her, but you want me to call on her first, right? Thank you. <laughs> okay, go on, please. Okay, so um, there are really good points made. I definitely saw both sides really well. Um, but I was caught on a little point uh, Justice Bernstein had made. Um, he brought up, like, the pressure felt by most citizens when talking to a uniformed officer. I do see and understand where that would come from. However, wouldn't he... Uh, your client or your guy, um, as a reasonable, per reasonable person, feel pressure if anybody had pulled in behind him and asked him, like, if, if they could ask him a couple questions. I do see, I do, like, I completely understand. We all check ourselves, like, when we're driving, we see a cop car, we're like, how fast am I going? Am I buckled? Like, we, we all do that. Um, but specifically when the police are involved, we have more rights, like, not to speak to them or to, like, keep to ourselves or not say anything, like, with the rights to remain silent outlined in the Miranda rights. My, my question was more of, uh, I wonder how you can think an officer without lights or sirens or whatnot, how do you think that affected him more in the case as opposed to, like, any other person? It could have been a friend of his or just a random stranger who happened to be driving behind him. Okay. Sure. And, and it is different, you know, as, as the justice has alluded to, having contact with the police automatically heightens anybody's, you know, perceptions of, you know, this is, this is important. And uh, it is different than an ordinary citizen. But in the end, until, you know, you're in violation of, law, of the law, uh, an officer has no right to seize you. So any interaction he has with you is nothing more than a congenial uh, interaction, no different than any citizen, even if he is wearing a badge and a uniform. Um, so the defendant in that case, I know you mentioned Miranda rights. Miranda rights come into play with an interrogation. Once someone is identified as a suspect and they are questioned in that capacity, then your Miranda rights come into play. But just walking up to an ordinary citizen on the street, that's not an interrogation. That, that's just a simple interaction. It could be investigatory questioning. Uh, such as, you know, is there a problem? Did your car break down? You know, why were you guys just sitting there in the middle of the road? Uh, he has a right to ask those questions just like anybody else. That, that's a good question. So uh, this goes to a reasonable person standard. You know, just th the average person, average human being. Uh, would that person have felt free to leave? I would have felt uncomfortable if, if I would have pulled into someone's driveway and there had been a police car behind me regardless if the emergency lights were on or not. And then if a policeman, woman, uh, would have confronted me, I would have more than likely engaged. And I've been practicing law for uh, a couple minutes. And if I felt that way a little way, and if I felt nervous the way that you do, and you follow the law, then you can only imagine in, in that circumstance. And uh, you had another part of your question too, um, there was another part of your question that you had as well. Uh, it was just like about like the pressure that one would feel, as in like if he had been able to pull out, would you feel more pressured to go in the grass if it was an officer as opposed to anyone else that had pulled? It out? wouldn't have been a natural movement, and you know I, th I think that that would have been it, it would have been difficult, and that's part of the reason why he didn't feel free to leave. And then, as as uh, Mr. Wanick had said before. 
Miranda doesn't kick in until it's a custodial interrogation, which a good chunk of the time a person is arrested. However, there's also about 11 factors that go along with that that I know that Justice Marcus has seen numerous times over his, his long career and that Mr. Wanick has seen as well. There's literally like 11 factors. It's not just one thing. So, thank Let, you for the let's question. Let's do our last question now. Please try to do it as uh, briefly as we can. I will, thank you. Um, just a clarification question, actually. Do you believe, I remember in the defense part of the argumentative phase, a lot of emphasis was put on how the um, accused would feel if they were approached by an officer, especially in uniform, and there were a lot of follow-up questions. Was this in accord uh, coordination with the exclusion law? Just trying to clarify whether or not the police officer was being hostile and acting in good faith. Sure. Um, you know, they, like we argued, the, just the simple interaction with the officer uh, didn't amount to a seizure. And uh, you know, the, the exclusionary rule applies if the seizure is unlawful. So the whole issue we were arguing today is at what point does that seizure take place? And you know, our position that we advocated today was that the seizure takes place when the defendant first mentions five minutes into the conversation, oh yeah, I don't have a valid license, and he just volunteers that information. That is when the Fourth Amendment will come into play. That is when you determine whether that seizure, if the officer placed him under arrest at that point, whether that was a lawful seizure. Because then, if it is, anything, any evidence he gains after that fact would not be subject to exclusion because it was a lawful seizure. But if it was unlawful, you know, then any evidence that comes about as a result of a, a, a unlawful seizure, that gets excluded. It's uh, it, pretty much from the unlawful seizure to the end of the case, no matter how much evidence has been seized, it could all be tossed out. It's what's called the fruit of the poisonous tree. That may be a term you, you've heard, but, uh, but it's, a, it's a legal concept that basically says from the moment that violation of the law occurs on the part of the officer, any work he did from that moment on, sorry, it, none of that evidence comes in. So really it comes down to, because most of our evidence in this case was, was seized or, or, or collected after that statement is made. And then through further discussion, he not only finds he's, he's suspended, but he finds that you know he can smell marijuana on him, he can smell alcohol on him. So then he starts questioning him, well, do you had anything to drink today? Have you used any marijuana? If so, how long ago? Uh, and I think he said he'd been fishing a few minutes before that and then consumed out on the ice, which I get it. I mean, you know, uh, fishing can be boring, you know, but um, <laughs> in any event, so, but that, all that evidence, including the blood that's drawn from him, you know, from that moment on, could be subject to suppression if that moment in time is determined to be unlawful. Mr. Yoakum? I'll be very brief. Uh, exclusionary rule, that's an accurate representation of it. And the, the old case, which we all go back to, it's called Wong Sung, the fruit of the poisonous tree. So if something was unreasonable in this, as uh, our SCOTUS, our Supreme Court has held, then that should be suppressed. And then that would not meet the, the good faith exception. The good faith exception is su supposed to ex uh, uh, protect, you know, reasonable police work where there's a reasonable mistake. And my argument is the seizure occurred when the officer pulled into the driveway behind him. And then anything after that should be suppressed. Thank you for the question. Thank you all for your participation today. I thank both counsel for their insights. Um, I hope this has been an instructive experience, and um, I hope it'll be a further instructive as uh, we proceed to the reception because I know the justices and the uh, council here will be more than glad to discuss uh, some of these matters with you further, but you do need to understand, of course, that the justices are not going to be able to share their uh, deepest views on this case right now. They'll have to speak to those later on, but in terms of the procedures and what you've witnessed today, I hope you will engage them, and I'm sure they'll be uh, <coughs> appreciative of the opportunity to respond. So thank you once again. Thank you to Hillsdale for your hospitality today. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, I want to thank all of you for being here. Students, we hope this inspires you in many ways. We hope it inspires you to be good law-abiding citizens. We hope it also maybe inspires some of you to think about going into the field of law. These things are important. We need good people 
uh, that consider such an occupation. Um, next, we have uh, a reception. Hillsdale College has been kind enough to provide a reception for the students. It's going to be out here. And then some of the people in the room have been invited to a special luncheon. You're going to go up the stairs and check in at that table. So thank you. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.